Hey there, I'm estate planning attorney Paul Rabelais, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to complete a probate without a lawyer. Yeah, you heard that right. So um, you might think it's a little unusual that an estate planning and an, and an estate administration lawyer would make a video about how to complete a probate without an attorney or without a lawyer. But the reason I'm making this video is really the same reason I make so many other videos is I have been asked the same questions over and over and over again for 30 years and I use these videos to answer some of those questions. So maybe, just maybe, somebody will see this video and I and that will save me some time and effort from having to answer that question. So this is one of those that, you know, I'm talking to people all the time. They had a loved one, a family member, a spouse, a parent pass away and we talk through things for a few minutes and then they're like, well, Paul, can, can I just um, do all this myself? So, yeah, I, get, <laughs> I even laugh just thinking about the question. So, I guess the, the correct question is, technically, it's possible that you could do it by yourself, but practically, not so much. So, I'll let you make your own deter determination at the end of watching this video. So let's talk about it. How you would complete a probate by yourself without a lawyer being involved. So if we are going to talk about how you can complete a probate, we've got to give it an example because everyone is so unique. Everyone's different from the whether they had a will or not, what were the terms of the will, who are the parties that are involved, what are the assets and debts that are involved that need to be dealt with, what are the relationships of the, of the people who are all involved. All that factors into it. So let's just use a hypothetical example of a father who died. He had a will. Let's keep it pretty simple. He, he, you know, he wasn't married. Maybe he was divorced or maybe his wife had, had died years earlier, but he did have three children. And he left his estate, really simple, to his three children equally. He named his oldest child as the executor, and you are that executor. Now we've got it in our example, you know, give him a, give, give him an estate. So he had a home, he had the typical stuff. He had a home, he had one or two bank accounts, perhaps even had a brokerage account. Um, he had a few debts, had some credit card debts and maybe some taxes that needed to be paid. And let's keep it simple, everybody gets along. So we got that going for us. And so now you're the executor and you're like, boy, there's a, I can go on YouTube, I can go on websites. Uh, seems to be these days lots of people are doing this do-it-yourself stuff. Surely I can complete a probate by myself and not have to you know, deal with a lawyer and pay lawyer fees and all of that. So let's talk about what you do. All right, you're the executor, you're in charge, those circumstances apply, let's get to work. All right, so the, probably the first thing that you'll do is, is you'll prepare some um, affidavits. And look, I'll be the first to realize every state's probate process is unique. I live and work and, and uh, practice law in my home state of Louisiana. Your rules are likely to be different in whatever state you're in, but the flow of what I'm about to talk about is pretty much the same regardless of where you live. In fact, if you have a really good working knowledge of your state's system, feel free to um, you know input whatever you'd like to input in the comments below. So, First thing you're gonna do is you're going to prepare some, some affidavits. We call it in our state affidavits of death, domicile, and airship. You gotta prepare some affidavits to prove to the to the court or you know that you'll file into the probate record at the courthouse showing that you're doing this at the right place. So in those affidavits, you'll type up all those affidavits that will state the you know, the parish or county where the person lived when they died, who are all of their heirs, and what are the relationship to the deceased uh, with all of those heirs. You'll get those affidavits prepared. You'll get them signed and notarized and filed in the succession record. And quite frankly, if you made a mistake a couple of months later when somebody reviews it, they'll kick it back to you and say, start all over again. So once you get those affidavits done, I'd say you're about, mm, about 2% of the way through. So what's next? Next is the will appoints you as the executor. Just by having dad name you as the executor in your will, you can't take dad's will to the bank and say, hey, look, dad named me as the executor. Let me, let me, give me access to his account so I can divide it up, you know, amongst the heirs that are listed in the will. It's, it's not that easy. Uh, this is a court supervised proceeding. You kind of can't do anything without a judge giving you the authority to do it. So your next step is to file all of the court, well, prepare, since you're doing it this yourself, you'll, you'll prepare 
then get all the signatures, and then file all of the required court pleadings that I'm about to go over with you that will enable you to be what's called confirmed as the executor. So you'll pull out your laptop and, and, and connect it to your printer, and you'll draft a petition that will be several pages long, and you'll be laying out in that petition why a judge should sign an order confirming that you're the executor. So you've got to lay out all the facts. Uh, So-and-so died on such and such date. He lived here, he lived there, he had uh, a family, uh, he had a will that's been filed, the original of which has been filed into the succession record. In his will, he named so-and-so as the executor. We're asking a judge to sign the order confirming that's, that I am the executor. Uh, if you are an executor who lives out of state from where the deceased person lived, you'll also on your computer type up uh, these um, uh additional court pleadings where you'll be appointing someone else who lives in the state where your father died. You'll be appointing that person as your registered agent for service of process. So you'll prepare all of those pleadings. You'll file all of those once they're all signed by the appropriate people. Uh, and in addition, you'll also uh, prepare and then sign your oath where you will swear that you will faithfully perform your duties as the executor. And then you'll get all that prepared. You'll get all that filed at the courthouse. And if everything looks good, then the judge will sign the appropriate court order actually confirming that you are the executor. But it, that step doesn't end there. That court order then goes to the clerk of court's office where the clerk of court will certify additional documents that you have prepared um, where the clerk of court certifies under seal that you have complied with all of the requirements to be the executor and the judge has signed the appropriate court orders that you drafted um, confirming that you're the executor. So a uh, lot of stuff there. And just kind of, by the way, if you got any of that wrong, a couple of months after you file it and somebody, either the judge or somebody in the judge's court uh, office or the clerk of court, a few months later, they'll kick it back to you and say, you know what, you made, you missed this piece or you didn't include that. Let's start all over again. Okay, so let's say you get through that. Now we're making a little bit of progress. So next you'll have to work with the IRS to get a tax ID number for the estate because you've got to go to your dad's financial institutions, open up an estate account, and of course the bank's lawyers are going to review the various orders and the what's called the either the letters of independent executorship or sometimes probably more commonly referred to as letters testamentary Again, all of which you prepared and all of which passed muster from the judge and the clerk of court, and they all you know, signed what they needed to sign, certify what they needed to certify to get you to the position where you are right now. Well, oh, quick, quick two second break. All right, so the next thing that happens is you'll work with the IRS to get a tax ID number, and then you'll go open estate accounts at financial institutions and hopefully the lawyers of the financial institutions where your father had accounts and those accounts are now frozen will honor the, the appropriate court pleadings that have been signed and certified and they'll move your father's funds into the estate account that you set up using the tax ID number that you got from the IRS. Okay, so now we're making some progress. Next thing you'll probably do is you'll start compiling what's called the inventory, or as we call it, the descriptive list of assets and debts. So you'll whip out your laptop again and you'll start cranking it all away and you'll have the right captions at the top showing the, the probate court number and the name of the probate and all of that other stuff you have to have in the caption of all the pleadings. And you'll start uh, compiling that inventory of assets and debts, everything that your father owned on the date that he died and any debt that he had on the date that he died. And kind of at, once you finish that, you'll sign swearing that you've shown all of the items in the probate estate and you'll swear that the values that you submit on that inventory are accurate. 
So all of, all of those pleadings require certain language in the description of the assets. They require certain formatting. So, you know, the judge and the judge's office can, can monitor and read that, you know, fairly easily. And I mentioned there's certain requirements on the description of each asset. For example, if your father lived at uh, 123 Third Street, you can't put his asset as 123 Third Street. So you might get clever and say, you know what, the tax assessor sent me a notice and they've got a little legal description and you put that, that's not good enough either. So when you describe your father's home, you need to describe it with the full legal description that likely was produced when he purchased the property. So there are certain ways that you have to describe each asset, but perhaps you'll get through that. And then, uh, and again, by the way, if you, if you mess up that detailed descriptive list of assets and debts, guess what they'll do? A couple of months later, once somebody takes a look at it and realizes all the rules weren't complied with, they'll kick it back to you and say, start this all over again. So you'll have to start it all over again, file it at the courthouse, wait a couple of months for it to make its way to a judge's office, and uh, hopefully the next time you will have it right. The next thing that you'll do is you'll likely start uh, preparing, whip out your laptop, and then start drafting and preparing all of the pleadings, which are what I call the petition for possession and the judgment of possession. So in the petition, that's the court pleadings where you got to lay everything out just right. You got to make it easy for the judge to say, yeah, I'm going to sign this this court order ordering that all these financial institutions release these funds to these people. So in the petition, you gotta lay it all out. So-and-so died, here's where he lived, here's the will, here's the executor, here's where his accounts are, here's everything he owned, here's his debts, his debts have been paid. And then, uh, you know, as long as you comply with all of the, all of the requirements and uh, submit all of the information that makes it easy for a judge to say, Yes, they've complied with all the requirements. I see all of the appropriate documentation. Then, assuming you did that right, the judge will sign the order ordering that any estate assets be transferred equally to you and your two siblings pursuant to your father's will. And guess what? If there's any mistakes there, it gets kicked back to you another few months of delay. Once you get through that and the judge does sign the order, and you might imagine a judge isn't going to just sign a court order ordering Schwab or Fidelity or your local bank just to release, whether it's $100 or $100,000 or a million dollars or $10 million, a judge isn't gonna just on a whim sign an order ordering those financial institutions to release all those funds unless all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. So that's when the I's aren't dotted and the T's aren't crossed, and quite frankly, you don't follow the rules that are outlined in your state's procedural rules, it gets kicked back and you gotta start all over again. That starting all over again is one of the reasons people complain about why this takes so long. Boy, it has taken years for us to get to this point. You know, you hear that a lot and it's because procedural rules must be followed. And even if they're followed correctly first time out, it's a slow process. But when there's a mistake and you got to start all over again, it often doubles and triples the amount of time that it takes. So let's say you get through that. The judge signs the appropriate order and then you get a, you get what's called certified copies of that order to record in the, in the land records of your parish or county to reflect the transfer of ownership uh, from the deceased name into the heirs' names of the real estate. And then of course, you'll take care of any final income tax returns that may be due. And of course, you're gonna to have to make sure that any debts that your father had get addressed, whether those are credit card, funeral expenses, medical expenses, part of your role is to make sure all that gets addressed. In addition to all of that, you're, you're going to have to handle some unique aspect that will pop up while all of this is going on, and you're gonna to have to know how to deal with it. Things like once you've finished, an asset or um, you find out that your father owned you know seven shares of stock that were was not listed on the inventory of assets what do you do there you get a bill from a healthcare provider or a credit card company after you've thought that you had paid all the bills and you divided up the money what do you do there 
or one of one or more of the heirs say, what is taking this so long? Because you're in charge of it and it's really your fault because it's taking a long time. Or you might run into a circumstance where a judge signed an order, but because the way the order was worded, a third party doesn't accept it. A, a legal department at a bank, a title company on a piece of property that needs to be sold. They may, they may say, whoa, this wasn't worded just right. We need you to amend the court order before we release any of the funds or stock or business interest that the person owned. Now you're starting all over again. Or what if during the process, heirs refuse to sign the paperwork because a judge isn't going to sign these order, this order ordering that financial institutions release funds until all of the heirs, all of the participants in the probate have signed off on that petition. So what do you do when one of the heirs says, whoa, I'm not real comfortable signing this. I need more information. And so how do you, hand, or, or for whatever reason, they don't sign it. So what do you do there? You're really stuck and you've got to resolve all those issues uh, before you can move forward. So that's a quick summary of how you handle a probate without a lawyer. In reality, I've been doing this as a lawyer for 30 years and I've been the lawyer for executors and heirs. I don't keep count, but it's been at least been several hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. And I will say in my 30 years, a lot of people have asked me, can I do it myself? And a lot of people have tried to do it themselves. And I would say one time in my 30 year career, have I seen someone do it themselves? And here was that circumstance. This was a retired engineer who had nothing else to do and spent all day, every day, trying to figure out how to prepare all of these court pleadings. I mean, he went to the courthouse, all of these uh, pleadings are public record. So he checked out um, probate after probate after probate from different probates, trying to find ones that were similar circumstances to his. And he was copying and pasting. And the problem was he got stuck probably 20 times. And every time he got stuck, he would come into my office and he'd have to get me to help him get unstuck because he was trying to do everything himself. And it didn't do me a bit of good to say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, you know, it would be a lot easier if you just let me handle it as opposed to you trying to get everything done and then you contact me every time you get stuck. There was no way that rationale was going to work because he was just dead set on doing it, quote unquote, himself. So that was the only time in my 30 year career I saw somebody, you know, do one of these things by themselves, but they needed a lot of assistance along the way and it was a really um, inefficient way for things to get done. So uh, can people do it without a lawyer? Technically, yes. Practically, it's not very efficient because just uh, making a mistake uh, adds additional expense and additional delay. And then whenever you have those delays, it causes stress among the participants because they have a reasonable expectation that things will be done timely. And, and just as mistakes get made, you know, mis mistakes being made often cause even more stress among the, among the participants or the heirs because, you know, as dear Abby said, if you really want to get to know somebody, share an inheritance with them. And so as people are waiting, they're, they're fearful that something may happen where this inheritance may poof, go away. So it can be a stressful time for, for participants. So there you have it. If you're wondering if you, you can do it yourself, watch this video, or I'm glad you watched this video. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything in the future. Give me a thumbs up. That would be great. I'd appreciate it. It doesn't cost anything. We'll see you next time.